Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 151 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined, as always, by our co-host, Omar Ansari. Eid Mubarak, folks. Eid Mubarak, Prabhupada. Assalamu alaikum, listeners. Hope everybody is doing well and enjoying the summer and enjoyed Eid. Eid al-Adha. That's right. How was your Eid? It was good. Well, uh, you know I was at your house last night, so <laughs> <laughs> so alhamdulillah, it was good. Got yeah. to spend uh, time with the family that's in town, some folks out of town, but alhamdulillah, things are good. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I was a little disappointed. It was a little low turnout where I prayed. Uh, I think it just given the uh, slightly divided Eid that we had mm-hmm. this time around, but uh, we're not here to sort of comment on that in any such way, just making an observation. Yeah. Um, probably other contribu- you know, contributing factors too. Uh, probably maybe even as simple as people just saying, hey, you know what, I'd rather celebrate on Sunday because I have the day off. But <laughs> you do mention Eid al-Adha, and, yeah. and that is uh, a theme of our conversation today. Absolutely. So every Eid now, uh, this has been like kind of a an Eid wish of mine for the last few years. And our guests can uh, vouch for this because I've reached out every time. Alhamdulillah, we are very delighted to have Professor Adi Atai back on the show for this, I think, very important conversation. So Omar, why don't you do the honors and you know, he's no stranger to the show, no stranger to, I think, most of our listeners. Uh, this is, I think, his fourth reappearance on the show. And you can definitely go back and listen to the prior episodes. But uh, Dr. Ali Atai is a scholar of biblical hermeneutics with field specialties in sacred languages, comparative theology, and comparative literature. He received his bachelor's in science and accounting from Cal Poly State University in 2000. In 2011, he received his MA in biblical studies from Pacific School of Religion, in 2016, his PhD in Cultural and Historical Studies and Religion from the Graduate Theological Union. Dr. Atai is a native Persian speaker. He can read and write Arabic, Hebrew, and Greek. Dr. Atai joined the Zaytuna College faculty in 2012. As at Zaytuna College, Dr. Atai has taught Arabic, Cradle Theology, Comparative Theology, Sciences of the Quran, Introduction to the Quran, and Seminal Ancient Texts. Welcome. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum. How are you? Good to see you guys. Mashallah. Thanks for having me again. It's always an honor to be here. It's been a while, but you know, yeah. happy, we're, re- happy returns. And we're in the MCC, the right. Muslim Community Center of the East Bay in Pleasanton, oh, yeah. California. When In previous uh, episodes, you've been in a studio, you've been <laughs> online in, during the COVID days. So um, yeah. this is a... It's good to be here. Yeah, this is my... Uh, favorite uh, Islamic center. So nice. I feel like I'm at home right now. So. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. I love all Islamic centers, by the way. You know, my kids, my kids, love, my, my girl, I have two daughters, and um, it took it took me a while to find the place that they found love the most, mm. and, and this is this is definitely it. So, mashallah, yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful place. So, I, I think as we were sort of teasing, uh, CD, um, like, and, I, and again, I, I know you and I have traded messages about this and why I've been kind of wanting to have you back on the show specifically mm-hmm. to sort of situate us, um, and more specifically, I guess I should say, situate the Prophet Abraham within the not only Muslim tradition, but in the larger sort of Abrahamic family, if you will. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to sort of defer to you in terms of where you'd like to start, but I thought maybe a good starting point would be. Ibrahim in the Quranic tradition, in the, mm. in the Muslim tradition, and then sort of use that as a way to venture into the other faith traditions. MashaAllah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yes, it's a beautiful topic. Ibrahim alayhi salam is, first of all, he's one of the greatest of the prophets in our tradition. So we have a, uh, we have five called the Ulul Azamin al-Rusul, and these are considered basically the greatest human beings to ever walk the planet. So you have Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he is, I mean, his name, you know, we call him Ibrahim, which is, which is an Arabicized uh, form of the name that the Quran uses. This was used by the Arabs at the time. His name in Hebrew is Avraham. Um, Avram, initially, according to the Torah, at least, which means exalted father. So Ab means father. Millet abikum Ibrahim, right? Mm-hmm. So we find that in the Quran. Kind of a clever sort of linguistic uh, nuance there. Uh, but then renamed, according to at least Genesis, Ab- Avraham, uh, which means father of many nations, right? Uh, so he is the father of the Arabs. He's the father of uh, the Israelites or the Jews. Um, and so, uh, and he is the spiritual father of billions of people on the earth. Um, and so, from a Muslim perspective, Ibrahim alayhi salam is highly respected, he's highly loved. Um, and uh, the Quran makes a claim 
that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is sort of, in a sense, renewing the original creed, what's known as the Milla of Ibrahim السلام, that there was a falling away for, for uh, there was a falling away with Ahl al Kitab, um, with the Jews. They've in in our tradition. Uh, there had been deviations from the Torah of Musa alayhi salam. There have been fabrications made to the text. Uh, this is something that's admitted in the Old Testament itself. Um, of course, Old Testament is Christian terminology. The Jews call it the Tanakh. But in Jeremiah 8.8, 8, for example, Jeremiah, he basically, you know, he's he's censuring the scribes of his day for changing. He calls the Torah, the, 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 the law of God, the Torah, has the false pens of the scribes have turned it into a lie. So we find this falling away, this deviation, not a total deviation, right? But there is a deviation. Uh, and then with the Christians, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, in the Quran, uh, Isa alayhi salam, as we know, was a true prophet of God. And he confirmed the truth of the Torah that was given to Musa alayhi salam. Uh, and according to um, scholars of early Christianity, uh, there was a group called the Ebionites, an early Christian group. Um, uh, and this probably wasn't uh, the origin of the word Ebionite was probably derogatory, evionim, it means like the, the poor people, the theologically poor Christians. Mm. It's probably used by proto-Orthodox Christians as sort of denigrate. But originally they're called the Notsurim or the Nazarenes. And uh, according to the Ebionites, uh, the Old Testament had suffered a bit of corruption, this kind of tahrif that the Quran refers to, uh, tahrif of the nas, of the text, and of the ma'na. Uh, so this is something that uh, precedes the claims of the Quran, at least. Um, but then the Christians, because, you know, there was sort of two main factions of the Christians, as the Quran says, فَآمَنَتْ طَائِفَةٌ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ وَكَفَرَتْ طَائِفَةٌ Right? So a ta'ifa, by the way, could be one man. So, um, uh, Allahu alam, it seems to me that the Quran here is referring to like this early conflict between Pauline Christians or Hellenistic Christians, although Paul is a Jew, but he's very Hellenistic, uh, and Jamesonian Christians. So a lot of Christians don't even know this, but Jesus had a brother, whatever that means. Scholars are divided as to what that actually means, but he has a brother named James, Yaakov at Sadiq, James the Just. And James was actually the successor of the early Christian movement. Mm the fledgling movement of the Nutsrim, that's the original name of the Christians, the Nasara, right? They weren't called Christians. Mm -hmm. um, and then so James was the head of the church, of, of the church as it were, uh, for 30 years. Uh, but uh, Pauline Christianity, because Constantine, right, uh, endorses Pauline Christianity. And when the Roman emperor puts his foot down, then that's, that's the end of the ball game, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So Ebionite Christianity or Nazarene Christianity sort of just uh, Whip, um, whimpers and dies. I mean, whimpers and dies. Yeah, but interestingly, uh, Christian scholars like Catholic scholars like Hans Kung, and then mm. you have other New Testament scholars like Robert Eisenman, um, James Tabor. They'll say that Jamesonian Christianity was actually resurrected with Islam, right? Ah, and Robert Eisenman, who's an atheist, uh, he has to have some sort of naturalistic explanation for that. He's not going to say the Quran, the Quran is a revelation, and <laughs> so he'll say the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. He's going into like caves and he's meeting like Ebionite Christians somehow, and they're teaching him the Gospel of James, and <laughs> he has to come up with something, right? Uh, but anyway, um, so according to our belief, then yeah. what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam brought is that milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? Uh, in the Quran makes an argument. That Ibrahim السلام, he was not a Jew or a Christian, right? Because Jew, I mean, it's anachronistic to call him a Jew. I remember once I looked, I looked up the name Abraham uh, on some online dictionary or encyclopedia or something, and it said an ancient Jewish patriarch. <laughs> well, that's anachronistic because the word Jew had was not even around at the time. Who, what, where does the word Jew come from? Uh, I mean, it comes from the grandson of Abraham, uh, let's see, no, great-grandson. So Isaac is the son of Abraham, mm -hmm. and then Jacob, who is his grandson. And then Jacob had a son, Judah, great-grandson. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually, um, the, the Bani Israel were called Yehudim, or El Yehud. And this happened actually in the eighth century before the Common Era. So there was a major attack in the Northern Kingdom of Israel like 722 BCE, something like that, by the Assyrians. So 10 of the 12 tribes were concentrated in the north of Palestine. And they were, there's different theories as to what happened. Mm. One theory is that they were completely wiped away. Another theory is that they were basically um, 
um, wiped away, annihilated, but there was a remnant that survived from all the 12 tribes. But nonetheless, the two tribes in the southern kingdom of Judah were Judah and Benjamin. And of course, Judah is the older brother. So at this point, all of Bani Israel, the Bani Yisrael, were called uh, Al-Yahudim, Ha-Yahudim or Al-Yahud. So, in, uh, according, so uh, Ibrahim was not a Jew, he was not a Christian, right? Um, because right. the word Christian comes from Christ, right? Well, I can kind of Hanifa Muslima according to the Quran, but he was a Hanif, which means like a monotheist, like a quintessential monotheist, and a Muslim in the sense that he. Now, somebody can argue here. Well, that's an that, that's an anachronism too, because there were no, no there were Muslims at the time. You know, there, there were no Mohammedan Muslims, but there were Muslims. Uh, meaning people who submitted their entire being to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, we believe also that Ibrahim alayhi salam knew of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, and he, and he prayed at, at the Kaaba, Rabbana, rab, Rabbana wab'ath uh, fihim rasulan minhum. So um, one question I had is, and I'll ask a couple questions. One is, what language did he speak? And uh, I'm, I'm actually, you mentioned the different versions of the names. What was the actual sound that way the, the name came out in, in the language that they spoke. And then where did they live? Mm-hmm. I know we uh, Muslims believe like he ended up in, 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 um, in Mecca at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my brain, I'm like, well, is that, how, how does that reconcile with like where the, the, the Jews and the Christians believe he lived? And was that like a long distance? Had, so some mm-hmm. of that kind of that actual, pra- those practical questions, I'm curious. Mm-hmm. So as far as language goes, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, as far as we know, uh, was born and raised in Ur of Chaldea, so what is today Iraq. So he spoke some sort of ancient Babylonian language, okay? Um, so, uh, and then his ancestors came from South uh, Ara- uh, Arabia Felix, which is South Arabia, or Yemen. Uh, so his ancestors were Semites, meaning they're descendants of, of Sam, the son of Noah. Uh, so, um, he, so definitely he spoke some kind of proto-Semitic language. We don't exactly know what it sounded like, so mm-hmm. certainly not Arabic or Hebrew of today, or even the Arabic of, of the Quran or the Hebrew of the Torah, but some uh, scholars call it, uh, linguists, they call it Ur-Semitish, like some proto-Semitic language that he knew. And then, uh, and then there was a sort of language in, in ancient Babylon, which was not Semitic, but rather Hamite, in other words, from Noah's other son, Ham, um, that, was also, that was inflected as well. Uh, so he probably was biling- bilingual in that sense. Mm. Um, so that's what he spoke. Um, and then, as we know, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, as a youth, he would uh, engage with the people, sort of theologically, right? He engaged with the king of Babylon, whose name was Nimrod, right? Uh, what a Nimrod he was. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so... You know, he debated with him. Nimrod lost a debate, and you know what he decided to do was cast him into a fire. Correct. So, as they were, as Ibn Abbas radiAllahu anhu says, as they were putting him on a catapult and they bound him to fling him into an inferno, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was probably 16, 17, 18, he said, "Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil." Yeah. Right. So you can you can see that strong iman that he had, um, and of course, Allah subhanahu wa taala, he made the fire cool and. Uh, for Ibrahim alayhi salam. So then he leaves, he makes hijr, inni dhahibun ila rabbi sayahdin, rabbi habdi min as-salihin, fabasharnahu bi ghulam in halim. Right? So then he leaves, uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him glad tidings of Ismail alayhi salam. So he goes uh, to uh, ancient Ka- uh, Canaan. Uh, he lives there from, for some time. Uh, and then, uh, according to our belief, he comes down into the Arabian Peninsula, into Mecca, with his eldest son, Ismail alayhi salam. I mean, he, he leaves them there initially yeah. um, when he was very young. This is mentioned in the Torah. There is some manipulation happening in the Torah. It's very clear. Now, the Torah, as we have it, the five books of Moses, the dominant opinion is that these books were actually four separate narratives that were stitched together about 500 BCE by someone called the Redactor. Most scholars believe the, the scribe Ezra. Um, and so you find sort of these four different styles of writing, four different chronologies, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So I'll just give you an example. Um, in Genesis, we're told that, uh, that Ishmael was 14 years older than Isaac, 14 years older. Uh, and then Ishmael was banished into the desert by Abraham on the day of Isaac's weaning. 
So, that, so a child is weaned in Jewish culture at three years old. So he's 17 years old. So this is a grown man, right? Uh, I mean, it also says in Genesis that Yusuf at 17 was a shepherd tending sheep. And so he's, he's a grown man, right? But if you keep reading the narrative, it goes on to say that uh, Abraham put the child on Hagar's shoulder, and then she's carrying him in her arms, and he's mm. crying, and you know he's sort of you know whiny and crying, and she puts him under a shrub, and he's kicking his feet, and <laughs> right. and then God says, "Lift him up in your hand; I shall make him a great nation." This is the profile of an infant. So something was manipulated here in the chronology of the Torah. I think what happened here is whoever redacted these stories wanted wanted it to appear as if Abraham wanted wanted it to appear as if. Uh, Hagar and Ismail alayhi salam are in the wilderness because of some fitna in the household of Abraham. Right. But if if Ismail is an infant, he would not have known his his brother Isaac for many many years. Mm -hmm. Certainly, that's not the reason why he's in the wilderness. Um, but anyway, uh, the book of Genesis. I mean, after that point, it basically says that 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 uh, Ishmael, which means God heard, by the way, God hears his prayer. Ishmael, mm. right. right. um, so basically that he lived in the wilderness of Paran, wherever that is. Some scholars believe that's the Arabian um, Peninsula. Um, it, it's pronounced Faran, Faran meaning the two who fled, right? So Hagar, Hajar alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam. And then he became an archer and that's all it says. And then later he buried his father Abraham with Isaac. So it seems that they they still had sort of ties. Yeah, right. You know, right. you know, you talk about um, you talk about a lot of changes happening in right. the scripture, and we know that the Quran isn't changed. Yeah. But what do scholars say is the reason that Allah allowed the earlier scriptures to be changed? Mm. There, there's a verse in Surah Al-Maidah that mentions that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala He gave the responsibility of the preservation to Ahl al-Kitab. Okay, and um, ultimately, why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala willed for the changes to happen, Allahu Adam, I don't, I don't mm. know. Um, but there is an opinion; it's a minority opinion, and I dabbled with this opinion a bit with my dissertation, because uh, <laughs> there was a scholar from Egypt named uh, Al Biqai, uh, Imam Ibrahim Ibn Umar Al Biqai, Rahimullah, whose opinion, and very much in a minority, was very much vehemently attacked for this, is that the text of the Torah in the in the New Testament, the Torah and the New Testament, is sound. The text is sound. The tahrif is in the is in the ma'ani, ma or in the tafsir, basically. Mm. Right, so it's not a popular opinion, uh, but it is out there. Uh, but the dominant opinion is no, the text has changed. And I think now with, with higher biblical criticism, we can actually prove that the text has changed. Uh, and so the Quran is vindicated in that, in, in that regard. You know, right from the Jewish scribes are those who, uh, who, who, um, who displace words from their proper places. Or you can say, here you can either say that they're sort of, you know, making up words and things like that, or they're decontextualizing the text, mm -hmm. which is a form of tahrif, corruption of the text. But the dominant opinion is tahrif is at both levels of the ma'ani and the nas. The meanings are corrupt as well as the text itself. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu alam, he gave the responsibility to, to them, and, and they failed to do it. And this is one of the reasons why the Quran is yeah. revealed. And I was going to say, like, categorically then says that the, that, the, that the task, if you will, of preservation, Allah takes upon himself. Upon himself. Exactly. That's right. Verily, we revealed a dhikr, and here a dhikr means the Quran, according to the Mufassirin, and we are its guardians. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's the last revelation. It mm -hmm. has to stay preserved. You know, and we know exactly how the Prophet sallallahu recited the Quran. There's no doubt about this. You know, and somebody might say, you know, there's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorant Muslims and they're blindsided by some Christian missionaries who will bring like a hafs, mushaf and say, oh, this is, this is different. And, and then the Muslim says, oh, I don't know what's, what's going on here. And, you know, so, I mean, just to give you an example, like, for example, in, in uh, hafs and asim, you know, we say Malik Yom Din, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the day of judgment. Uh, but in Warsh and Nafir, Maliki Yom mm -hmm. right? So there's a difference. The rasam is the same, right? So the, basically the, the script looks exactly the same, but it's a different articulation. Uh, and so 
I mean, here, um, obviously, we have SN need. We have chains, robust chains of transmission that go all the way back to the Prophet Sallallahu But even if we forget that for now, just think about this logically. Is it logical that the Sahaba just had a difference of opinion as to how the Prophet recited the Fatiha? It doesn't, it doesn't make any, How many times did they, did they hear the Prophet recite the Fatiha? I actually did the math on this years ago. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, um, what was it, like 38,000 times or something. You know, so clearly he said it both ways. Right? right, and that's why they're they're preserved, and we have this idea of ahruf that the Quran is revealed in seven uh, variations, and this is this hadith is tawatir. It's it's mass transmitted. It's diffuse congruence. <laughs> it's <laughs> Thank mass you. transmitted. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, <laughs> well, I love it. Um, that could be the blurb from the episode. Um, <laughs> but um, the uh, I, I guess I wanted to go back, and you've covered so much material, and so I hope this it doesn't. This isn't lopsided for the listener, mm -hmm. but you mentioned that the Quran refers to the Prophet Ibrahim as being Hanif. Yeah. Right. Now, etymologically, the word Hanif, I think, it means literally sort of against the grain, if you will, or or pigeon mm -hmm. pigeon legged. I think was a definition. The idea being again that you're sort of right against the grain, mm -hmm. meaning that the overwhelming sort of zeitgeist, if you will, of the time would be polytheism. And yeah. and and that these uh, that this you know group would be holding on to the strictures of monotheism would be known as the um, right Hunafa. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely. Um, and and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam before the Bi'atha mm -hmm. was from the Hunafa, yes, so right. he was never from the Mushrikeen, right? Uh, and this is something that's part of our aqidah. Um, and the proof of that is his childhood miracles. There's a called Irhas, like Bahira the monk. Right when he saw the caravan approaching, uh, he noticed that there was a. It was a very hot day. There was a cloud shading the men, and a cloud from the Bible uh, is denotes divine protection. Right. So in the book of Exodus, it says that the Bani Israel, when they're in the Sinai, uh, a cloud would hang over them, guarding them from the sun, uh, and then a fire would be in front of them, sort of guiding them by night. Uh, so he knew there was something special here. Um, so, um, so the Prophet sallallahu he was from the Hunafa. He was yeah. from these. There's different ways of translating it. You know, monotheists, primordial monotheists, mm. those who are true in faith, um, uh, like that. Uh, and so, uh, and so, some of the Jews in, in Medina they hesitated to accept the Prophet sallallahu Some of them did, but they didn't join the Ummah. What for whatever reason, maybe there was family pressure. There's a hadith in Bukhari that the Jews would sneeze on purpose in the in the majalis of the Prophet Wasallam, and it says in hopes of him saying Yarhamukumullah, <laughs> because they knew he was a prophet mm -hmm. and he knew why they were doing that. So he said, uh, he said, uh, Allahu yahdikum wa yuslihu balakum, like may Allah guide you and 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 correct your states. Mm -hmm. So many of them, many of them, he was a prophet. Others said, well, he's not from Bani Israel. Right, so we can't really follow him, right? Uh, and then the Quran makes that statement that Ibrahim salam, is not from Bani Israel. Ibrahim salam, is not a Jew. And yeah. people who are honest, scholars who are honest, rabbis who are honest will say that's exactly true. In, in, uh, they say, if, uh, Avraham Avinu, our liege lord, our father Abraham, not a Jew, right? So this idea that a prophet has to be a Jew, um, a lot of these ideas in, in Judaism, they're actually after Islam. People don't realize that. A lot of these kind of ideas that are taught in systematic Jewish theology are like late antique. <laughs> yeah. They're kind of in, right. in, uh, in um, response to Islam and Christianity, yeah. right? Uh, because the, the, you know, the first you know, Jewish systematic theologians are, you know, Sadia Gaon, he's like 10th century, the common era, Maimonides and, and uh, Judah HaLevi. These are all after Islam. Hmm. Right, so uh, there are stories in the Quran that are also found in the Talmud, and of course the knee-jerk reaction of the Orientalist: oh, the Quran is copying these stories. But there's legitimate debate. You know, if you you know if you go to, I had a colleague who went to Harvard, and or Yale, sorry, and he said that there's a legitimate debate. Many scholars believe that the Talmud is taking these stories from the Quran. <laughs> wow, <laughs> because Islam just you know when it when it came on the scene, it was just everywhere. Right. Right. And so, you know, these, these stories trickled into Jewish, I mean, the, the Babylonian Talmud, I mean, these, you know, eighth, ninth century, I mean, this was an open text for many centuries. Mm. So many additions were made, 
even Genesis Rabbah, this, you know, this, this famous tafsir, this midrash of the book of Genesis, you know, this text remained open for centuries. You know, rabbis would add things and, and delete things and things like that. If, if there's something in, in, in the Torah, for example, that the Quran can, definitely what we have in, for example, Genesis was before the Quran. Mm -hmm. It's not at the time of Musa, but it's, it's before the Quran. The Quran calls itself a musaddiq. It's, it's confirming, confirming certain aspects. That's right. The Quran admits that up front. Obviously, we have a flood tradition. We have, a, we have an Exodus narrative. We have a story of Yusuf, so, but the Quran has these really interesting changes, you can say, or we would say corrections to the story that oftentimes are overlooked. For example, in the, in the Yusuf story, in the Quran, the, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, the whole surah is a chiasm. It's a big sort of symmetrical structure. It's very interesting. Um, and if, if the author of this is not writing this down, it's basically impossible to do this in your head. Uh, 111 ayat. In other words, the beginning of the surah mirrors the end. The second part mirrors the second to the uh, last oh, really? part. And then the right in the middle, that's that's called the amud, according to our scholars, or the pivot or the focus, as as Western scholars have referred to it. Right at the center of the surah, you have Yusuf alayhi salam in prison making da'wah to his cellmates um, before he interprets their dreams. That pivot is missing from the Torah because the Torah is more tribal. It's more sort of us against them. We're the Israelites. These are pagans. Right. But the Quran is more universal, right? Uh, we also find that in the Exodus story, and you know, in Exodus, let my people go, and so on and so forth. Whereas your your you know, Egyptians were Bani Israel, but in the Quran, Musa alayhi salam is commanded by Allah to bring Pharaoh a qawl and layin, like speak to him like a gent in a gentle way. He might believe. Call him to Allah, right? Yeah. Pharaoh, right? Uh, so we find these little, really interesting nuances. Um, mm. And and you touched on this before. When did the when did the Jewish people become like self aware of themselves as a people? Because you, we because you, if you go to the time of Moses, they are Jews in in the land of Egypt by then. And you talked about Judah. It was is it like really his children and his children's children? They became like a tribe, and then that tribe grew. Is that like this first? Yeah, self I mean, there were Jews in Egypt. Depending on how you're using the term Jews. I think that's his question. Yeah. Like yeah. How, how, how should we use the term historically? Yeah, at so this that's point. a very interesting question. I yeah. asked a rabbi in person, I said, right. I said, uh, what was the name of the religion of Moses? There you go. You yeah. know, I asked him, and yeah. this is what he said. He said, I don't know, probably Islam or something, <laughs> <laughs> or some variation of that. And I looked at him like he was joking, and he said, no, I'm serious. Like, because like the word submission. Judaism, yeah, yeah, this is a later term, yeah. right? So he said, I don't know, but it was probably something like submission to God or something like that. So if, to give the, the listeners, um, maybe I'll use an example here that, that was used a long time ago by Sheikh Ahmad Didat, rahimahullah. He said, you know, if Musa alayhi salam walked into the room. I'm just about to quote you him on my next question <laughs> uh, about this idea of walam and halim versus walam and hakim. But anyway, uh, we'll get to it. Because yeah, yeah. Adidat has a very interesting take. So yeah, yeah. anyway, rahimahullah. Yeah, no, no he, Please. Said, if, he said if Musa alayhi salam walked into the room and we were to ask him, uh, are you a Jew? He would say, no, I'm a Levite. Because he would think that I was referring to a tribal distinction. Because there are 12 right. tribes, mm -hmm. right? 12 sons of Jacob. Each one is the sort of progenitor of one of the tribes. So he would say, no, I'm not, I'm not a Jew. You know, um, I'm a Levite. I'm from Levi. Uh, and I said, well, no, no, no. I meant, are you a practitioner of Judaism? He would not know what I was referring to. What's what's Judaism? Mm -hmm. You know, because the term was not around. You know, so right. ah, Sheikh Ahmadi, that Rahim Allah, he says, I would expect, and Musa alayhi salam to say, the name of my religion is submission to God, mm -hmm. right? And this is how the Quran describes the sons of Jacob, Muslimin, the, the disciples of Isa alayhi salam, Muslimin, right? I mean, they're Nasara because that's, you know, that's the Ism Nasab. They come from Nazareth. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the religion? Christianity is a later term. Yeah, know. it's basically what you're, what you're kind of adding layers to our belief that, like, they were Muslims, essentially. And, and yeah. they weren't following a religion of Judaism. When we're talking about, like, Abraham. Yeah, Prophet there's Abraham. Noahidic Muslims. Yeah. There's, yeah. you know, Muslims under Noah. That's Abrahamic right. Muslims. Right. There's Mosaic Muslims. There's uh, Christic Muslims or Isawi Muslims. And there's Muhammadan Muslims, right? And the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa he's the final messenger of God. And he confirms all of the prophets that come before him. And he brings us the Abrahamic Millah in its purity, mm -hmm. right? This is something that Isa, alayhi also, even according to the four Gospels, uh, you know, he's preparing... 
the Bani Israel. He, you know, he's saying in John chapter eight, and I know there's, there's historical problems with the Gospel of John, but this very interesting statement, you know, where he says to the Pharisees who are attacking him, he says, you know, uh, or sorry, this is in, um, uh, no, this is in John chapter eight. He says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do as Abraham did, meaning that. Um, just because you have Abrahamic blood doesn't make you Abrahamic. You have to do the works of Abraham, mm. right? And then in the Gospel of Luke, he says to Zacchaeus, who was like this little, I, I guess he would, you would call him a midget. He was very short. He was in a tree because he couldn't see Jesus coming into the city. Uh, and then he says to Jesus, come to my house and I'll host you and I'll give my money to charity. And he says, this man too was a son of Abraham, you know? One question I have is, why is, why is Eid al-Adha... And why is Hajj and all these practices, why are they modeled after Prophet Ibrahim? Was that just because that always been the case, even before uh, Prophet Muhammad saw some? Or was it something that he, like, he retaught people? Um, so I don't know if we want to, that, that's a question that I want to yeah. connect it to Eid al Adha. Sure, sure, sure. Um, we can I mean, touch on it now or, or later. I think now is fine. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think, like, since we're still talking about. Ibrahim in the Quran, wow. you know, like I think I wanted to touch on the idea of millat, I think, which we've done. Uh, the Quran also refers to the Prophet Ibrahim as an ummah. Mm. Um, and so I, I wanted to sort of get your thoughts on that and sort of what the what the meanings there are. And from there, I think if we want to transition directly into the story, um, since we are recording the day after Eid, uh, certainly the days of Tashriq, to talk about um, the actual, uh, you know, story of mm. the... Uh, sacrifice and maybe there I can because yeah. uh, there's some ambiguity, if you will, at, at the very least around who's the son, you know, being sort of sacrificed yeah. and so and, on. And, and so. And, but but aside yeah. from like the details of the story, like why? No, no, sure, like, sure. Why, I think he why, can, yeah, right, why, right, why, right. why, Prophet Ibrahim? Why um, was it? Because one option is, hey, there, it was always like that, and they were there. That's what that's what that's what they did when the people went to Mecca. And they were they doing it for hundreds of years even prior to, uh, you know, this, the seventh century, or was it a matter of like Prophet Muhammad saw some taught something uh, that people had forgotten or was quote unquote new to, to the people? I think it was a renewal. I think Islam is essentially um, a, uh, a, a reformation, if you will, of, of Judaism and Christianity. Uh, so the Arabs at the time of the Prophet wasalam, they certainly knew of their lineage. They knew they were from Ibrahim wasalam, mm -hmm. and they knew they were from Ismail wasalam. That was something that was just something they knew part of their society, just like they do when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran about the feel, the incident of the ashab feel. Everyone knew what the Prophet was referring to or what Allah was referring to. So they knew that. Um, and so some, so the Kaaba and these things, the Maqam Ibrahim, um, you know, the stoning of the shaitan, these were things that were known by the by the, yeah. the Arabs, the, mush, the mushrikeen. But, but over time, yeah. they, they uh, deviated from monotheism. Right. Even though the essence of Prophet Ibrahim's story was monotheism, they yeah. think so. In a way, it's a kind of a they knew about him, but they weren't necessarily following the essence of his story. Yeah, and they would justify their shit. They would say, "No, Allah is so great oh, okay, okay. that we need to go through these intermediaries." Correct. Right, because Allah is just is he's too he's too great. He's too powerful. And the Quran makes an argument: Yes, he is great, but he's also close. You know, he's closer to you than your jugular vein. In fact, going through these intermediaries, this is a type of shirk. Mm -hmm. And this is not from the uh, sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that he repudiated any type of idolatry, any type of intermediate, intermediate worship. Not this idea of tawassul, right? This is something that's found in our aqidah, but actually worshiping, believing that some idol or something has some sort of intrinsic ability to help and or harm you, that is shirk. And that is not from the millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, so the Prophet sallallahu he's bringing this, he's renewing this. Uh, and then you're right, Ibrahim alayhi salam is called an ummah in the Quran. I asked one of my teachers about that, and he said the meaning there, one of the meanings is that the word ummah is, is related to the word imam, uh, so that he's, uh, he's a great uh, leader. Which the Quran uh, also categorically calls him. Calls right? Ibrahim exactly, Ibrahim. Yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the Quran says yeah. also that um, that uh, this is the middle of your father Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam, so that the messenger might be witnesses over you, and that you might be shuhada ala nas, witnesses over the people. Right. In, in other words, we're supposed to sort of be these role models uh, for for the people, and this was a something that was given to Bani Israel, right? And this is the the essence of their chosenness, right? So uh, again, if we if we look at 
if we look at honest, you know, academic, uh, you know, rabbis, they'll say, you know, why did God choose Bani Israel? They say, we don't know. He, he, God chooses whomever he wills. Uh, but he chose us to do what? To bring the light of El Echad, Tawheed, to the Goyim, to the nations. That's our task. And if we fail to do that, then God will replace us with another people, you know. Yeah. And this, and even this idea of the Holy Land being theirs. Yeah, God gave them the Holy Land. That's what it says in, in the Bible. But there's many, many warnings to Bani Israel and the traditional Orthodox, the Haredim, the Jews that are anti-Zionist, they quote these up and down. They're every Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Deuteronomy, that if you do evil in the land, God will thrust you out. In other words, I'm giving you this land on condition of your mm -hmm. obedience. Right. And if he thrusts you out, then you are to stay in exile, okay, until, uh, until the Messiah comes. You have to wait for the Messiah. That's traditional Judaism. The vast majority of Jews believe that, right? So they have this idea of, look, uh, we, we've been chosen. You know, there's a short poem. It's a couplet. It's very short. It goes like this. How odd of God to choose the Jews, right? That's it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but he did. He chose them, yeah. you know, and, you know, to, to be a light to the nations but to bring the light of monotheism. And it's very interesting, the Prophet wasallam, he did more for monotheism than all of the Hebrew prophets put together. And this is something that rabbis acknowledge. That's why they're very, very hesitant to call him a liar. They're very hesitant to do that because their, their whole claim to fame is monotheism. Correct. Right? And he was this incredible giant of monotheism. So you have rabbis like Rabbi Nathaniel Al-Fayumi, who was a Yemenite rabbi, but originally from Egypt. So he writes in his book, Bustan Al-Uqul, which is called um, Gan Hasikhlim or something in, in Hebrew. But he wrote in Arabic, and he says, uh, he says that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a Nevi Emmet, that he's a true prophet, he has to be, mm. but he's not for Bani Israel. So in other words, he's for 99.999% of humanity, but he can't be for us because he, you know, we have to follow the commandments and nothing can supersede the commandments and et cetera. Uh, um, and this appears to be, you know, sort of a general sentiment as well among many Jews in Medina, Medina to Menorah, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he's a prophet, but he's not for Bani Israel. Because his, um, his monotheism is very powerful. Of course, with Zionism, mm. everything is kind of flipped yeah. on its head. And right? we definitely want to talk about that, yeah. but I wanted yeah. to sort of save that, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, sure. towards the end. Um, yeah. I guess w if we could then sort of pick up. So with regards to the story of the sacrifice then, yeah. um, you know, uh, and what I was sort of alluding to where um, the Quran itself is sort of ambiv ambivalent in the sense of not mentioning, yeah. you know, whether it's Ismail or Ishaq. Uh, yeah. And I wish, you know, I wanted you to sort of comment on that. Um, yeah. And I, now is as good as time as any. What I was referencing about Ahmadidat, you know, Rahimullah, he used to say, mm -hmm. like the Quran says, فَبَشَّرَنَّهُ بِغُلَامٍ حَلِيمٍ when referring to, you know, Ismail, yeah, yeah. and says, بِغُلَامٍ حَكِيمٍ when it refers to uh, uh, Ishaq. And so Hakim being sort of the wise, mm -hmm. maybe even conniving, uh, you know, if you <laughs> want to go down that road. But, uh, and then Halim obviously being sort of, you know, sort of tempered and mm. sort of the archetype mm. of the Jew or the archetype of, of type of the Arab, right? Yeah. Halim versus Hakim. And certainly in the book of Genesis, Jacob is this kind of trickster figure mm. uh, and to the point where I think it's uh, a bit problematic from our perspective of our Aqidah. I mean, he's constantly tricking people. I mean, from the very beginning, he's, he's grabbing Esau's uh, uh, ladder or the, no sorry yeah yeah, he, yeah so so i was name, thinking of jacob's ladder the, 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 that's a later story that's later yeah and then jacob wrestles the angel he wrestles the angel yeah. and that's where the israel comes right israel yes he, he struggles with god right you know so you know, israel the one who struggles with god is going to be sort of a struggle to, to to you know keep god's commandments whereas ismail's way is submission to god mm. right it, it doesn't mean that you turn your brain off Right. You know, if you look in the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do you raise the dead? And then Allah says to him, and Allah knows the answer. Do you not then believe? He says, yeah, I believe, but I want it's minan in my qalb. I want like, uh, like um, tranquility, tranquility or... in my mind. And mm. the qalb in the Quran, Imam Ghazali argues, is the mind. Mm. The, it's not the physical heart. It's the mind because lahum qulubun la yafqahuna biha. They have hearts with which they don't understand. Or, or lahum qulubun uh, they have hearts with which they reason, right? So Ibrahim alayhi according to Imam al-Razi, is seeking a deeper understanding 
of how Allah gives life to the gives gives mm -hmm. life to the deaf, uh, gives life uh, to to the to the dead. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam, he is a Muslim, he submits, but it's a submission that's rooted in knowledge. It's not this, because people, you know, they get the wrong idea and they think Muslims, they turn off their brains because it's all about submission. No, you submit because it's intelligent to submit. You know, it's like when they come to, you know, Bani Israel is leaving, you know, Egypt, according to the Quran, and also in the Torah, but in the Quranic story, they come to the Red Sea and they look in front of them, there's water, and they look behind them, there's Fir'aun and his Junud, and they say, Inna la mudrakun, which means like, we're done. But they forgot they were dealing with uh, Musa alayhi salam, who's dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the sovereign Lord of the universe. And this is what the intellect, uh, it, this is intelligent. Mm. And this is what the intellect tells us. And so he says, Kalla ina ma'i rabbi sayyahdeen, soon my Lord will guide me. You know, um, so, uh, but it's an interesting, you know, Hakim. Yeah, sure. And in, uh, you know, the Arabs generally are very forbearing people. They show great forbearance. You know, look at the Palestinians, you know, right. they, exactly. they, they've shown incredible forbearance. People, they don't realize that, but it's true. You know, yeah. um, that's just how they are. Right. They're a forbearing people. And so uh, that's an interesting, maybe clue as to what, yeah. what who, who the child is. But you're right, the Quran does not tell us explicitly. The point is not to be explicit here because we don't want this thing to turn tribal again because for the Jews, it's very important. It's Isaac to the point where Ismail alayhi salam unfortunately, in many cases, is insulted. You know, he's uh, denigrated. Um, and then for the Christians, it's also very important for it to be Isaac because this, is whole, this whole thing is like a dress rehearsal for the crucifixion. So the early church fathers, they would say, so in the, the early church fathers, they had to find evidence of <laughs> Jesus's deity and death in the Old Testament. It's very hard to do that, right? So um, instead of using ex exegesis, which is like tafsir, yeah. they would use something called eisegesis, uh, which means to put something into the text that isn't there. In other words, I see Jesus, right? I see Jesus. <laughs> kind of a little wordplay there. But, uh, so they'll say, Thanks, oh, man. the crucifixion, you know, Abraham, father, is putting wood on his son's mm. back, making him march up a hill. Ah, interesting. Uh, and, yeah. uh, but then like, okay, keep going, keep, what happens at the end? He doesn't actually kill us. <laughs> and, it, and it has to be an ancestor to top it off. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Fascinating. So to sort of dress rehearsal yeah, for the dress, crucifixion. Right. But I would say it didn't happen. Yeah. God right. intervened and <laughs> saved him. And they'll say, well, it was just kind of delayed. Eventually, yeah. you know, <laughs> a son of Isaac will be killed and that's Jesus, right? That's mm. what that's. Um, nice yeah. rebuttal though. Like, I mean, right? When, when you when you question them on, on, well, if you play that story out, it doesn't end exactly. the, way you, the, the way it should, yeah. at least per your um, yeah, exactly. yeah, analysis. Um, but here's another thing yeah. I want to make another point. Yeah. Um, in, the, uh, in the Talmud, so a lot of people don't know this, but Jews, at least in the Orthodox tradition, believe that Moses received two Torahs on Mount Sinai. So he received the five books, and then he also received the oral Torah, which is basically his ability to sort of comment on the Torah. So some of the rabbis in Gen this, Genesis 22 is called the Akeda passage, the binding of Isaac, the sacrifice of Isaac. So a good rabbi who knows his sources will look to the uh, Talmud as commentary uh, for example, Rashi is a very famous medieval rabbi named Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yiksaki. Um, the Jews, they love these sort of uh, acronyms, you know, like Rambam, Maimonides, Ramban, Nachmanides, and then Rashi. Anyway, um, so Rashi, he actually quotes in his commentary the sort of uh, full text of what God said to Abraham regarding the sacrifice. And this is from the Talmud. Uh, so it's he says, you know, God said to Abraham, sacrifice your son. And then Abraham says, which son? And then God says, uh, um, your only son, yachidka in Hebrew. And Abraham says, ze yachidka le'immo, vaze yachidka le'immo. This is the only son of his mother, and this is the only son of his mother. And then God says to him, uh, the one that you love, asher ahavta. And then Abraham says, ani ohev shenehem. I love both of them. Right, so that's that's what it says in in the Talmud, right? But if you know Christian apologists who don't know these things, or these kind of really hardcore anti-Arab uh, uh, Jewish rabbis who who either have not studied these things or deny these things, they'll say Is Ismail alayhi salam is illegitimate and he was he was not loved because it says in Genesis twenty two two, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, right? So on the surface, it seems like. Isaac is the only son that Abraham loves. But if you look at the full tradition of the Talmud, 
which which is also considered to be a type of revelation according to the orthodox tradition uh no he actually loves both of them do um it, and, do scholars christian and uh, jewish scholars do they acknowledge uh arabs coming from ismail or is that do. purely a no they do they okay. do now you always have these kind of revisionists right you have Christian revisionists today that say, no, there's no evidence of this. And there are even people like these, this guy, you know, Spencer, who <laughs> he said the Prophet I said, never existed. Uh, Robert. It's, called, it's called radical, Robert Spencer, uh -huh. radical revisionism. You have people like this too, Jesus, Jesus mythicists, right? Uh, Jesus never existed. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so you'll, you'll always have these sort of, the, the school of revisionism. Sure, sure. But generally, yeah, Maimonides yeah. says, and, and Maimonides is, probably the most respected philosopher and theologian uh, the, the Jewish world over. And he says in his Jerusalem letter, yeah, he says the Prophet ﷺ is an Ishmaelite. Mm -hmm. He's very he's explicit mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And fortunately, and, the context of it is not very good because he's claiming, he, he, he's <laughs> taking credit for killing Jesus yeah. in, the, in that passage that the Beit Dean did it. He doesn't mention Romans. He said, we did that. Right. No, and it's fascinating you say that, all, like, you sort of give some context to uh, what is out there, even from a Jewish perspective, around the identity of the child. Because uh, I've always sort of marveled at Muslims who sort of then make it a point of contention to insist that it's Ismail. But yeah. it seems that if that is the case, I almost want to give some some allowance for the fact that that may in many cases just be in sort of response to the sort of, you know, from what's yeah. coming from the opposing side, yeah, yeah. as opposed to, yeah. you know what I mean? Something yeah. that is theologically of necessity for us, because I yeah. would argue it isn't, but now I kind of see the response of yeah. why you would insist that it's Ismail. Yeah, this is why we have I to you know, be careful and keep our emotions in Correct. check. Correct. Right? You know, as Plato says, the tripartite division of the soul, you have the, you have the rational soul, the appetitive, and the emotive mm. so the rational soul and that's why you know one of my teachers said the human being is upright istiqama so the, the brain is above the emotions which is above the the mm. desires the intellect has to keep those other things in check in fact in arabic aqal literally means to like control something the harness the right, harness right, yeah. right. Agal, like that you would even harness the camel exactly and that's based on the hadith yeah. so a man came and he said should i should i let my camel go free <laughs> or tie her down and trust in allah what should I do? And he said, "Iqilha wa tawakkal ala Allah." Mm -hmm. Right. So even aqida, right, is that like the tie? The, is, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so this is bind. a genuine difference of opinion. There were big Sahaba, like Sayyidina Ali, who said it was Isaac ibn Mas'ud, I think, also. Mm. He, these are huge. Sayyidina Ali, you know, <laughs> karamallahu wajha. Right. You know, so um, who held the opinion that it was? You're saying Ishaq. It was, it was Ishaq. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. That, right. that was his opinion. Right. You know, it's a it's a minority opinion, but that opinion is there, and it's a valid opinion. Do do the Shias believe that's the majority? That's their that's their main viewpoint, or is that um, did that not transfer over to their? Fifth, I don't think they have their, that their, tradition. Or their yeah, tradition. I don't yeah. think. Okay. That. Okay. Yeah. If, if if there's a if there's a companion uh, in the chain that is not a Shiite, they won't accept it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they'll just take from their imams. So I don't know if they have that tradition. Uh, I would imagine it's the same that they, the dominant opinion is Ismail mm -hmm. alayhi salam. Okay. Um, but yeah, so this shouldn't be a point of contention for us at all. I, I guess before we transition away from the, the sort of within the Quranic narrative or the Islamic narrative about the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, um, it, it would be worth noting that uh, the Quran also, you know, again, specifically uh, calls Ibrahim alayhi salam as a Khalilullah, that Allah took him as a Khalil. So I wanted you, I wanted you to sort of comment on that and what the sort of implications may be, how that may even resonate in uh, sort of, uh, you know, in, in biblical uh, tradition as well. Fr friend. A friend, I'm sorry, yeah. Khalil. Friend of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's different words for love in Arabic. Um, so you have mawadda, right? Which is yeah. like Dawood is related to the word mawadda, even in Hebrew, David is like beloved of God. Hmm. Mawadda is like this kind of, you know, Allah says in the Quran that he, put, Allah he is. put Mawadda between hmm. the spouses, right? Right. So it's this kind of mutual respect and love and, you know, a, 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 a willingness to sacrifice for the other person. This is Mawadda. And then you progress to uh, Khulla, which is like uh, companion love or intimate love. You know, someone who's, you know, so first you meet your wife and, you know, you, you love your wife and you're willing to sacrifice some of your comfort to make her comfortable, right? 
and then you actually have a friendship with your wife, you know, which is, <laughs> you know, it's a good thing. <laughs> we should do that. So you have the same friends and you're hanging out. Right. You know, you don't have your friends, you don't have her friends. So you actually enjoy spending time together. So that's, that's khulla, right? And then, and then you have uh, ishq, right? Which is, which is not in the Quran, but, um, you know, so it's a type of intimate love uh, that comes and goes, it like flashes. Um, and then mah- mahabba is like unconditional love, right? So Ibrahim alayhi salam is called Khalilullah um, in the book of Isaiah. He's also called the friend of God in the book of James in the New Testament. So all three major scriptures refer to him as the friend of God. And why is he the friend of God? Is because as you pointed to, uh, earlier you said that Ibrahim alayhi salam at some point was basically the only monotheist in his society. And so he really didn't have any friends except Allah. So mm. total dependence and tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised his degrees and gives him this exalted title. Allah is the friend of all the prophets. Every prophet is Khalil Allah, but he has something special. There's something special about him where Allah calls him Khalil Allah. Just like Allah loves all of the prophets, obviously. But the Prophet says, Salam, he's Habib Allah, because Allah is trying to emphasize something about him specifically. So he's like the beloved of God par excellence. So, Allahu Alam, this is probably the meaning. It, it sort of denotes his total dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as his only companion, and then Allah reciprocates that love and raises his degrees and raises his, his rank in this world. And that's why he's the father of all nations. Are there any other prophets who have the special names like that? Their own title, special titles given to them? So uh, Musa alayhi salam is called Kalimullah. Kalim, yeah. So, Kalam, word, like the speech of... Yeah, mm-hmm. he's, he, so mm-hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi wa kallam Allah Musa taklima. So this taklima at the end of the verse is called a uh, infinitive absolute. So there, in, in other words, God spoke to different prophets, but there's something really special Right. about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. And in the Jewish tradition, they actually go into this. They say that, they say that Musa alayhi salam, or Moshe they call him, alayhi salam, alayhi shalom, sorry. Uh, Moshe, they, uh, they call him Ravinu Moshe. They said that um, God or Hashem uh, spoke to Moses like a friend. In other words, uh, um, very casually. They, they would say that other prophets, when God spoke to them, would be sort of struck down by the power of God, and it would be a bit painful, or they would, or they, they would be asleep. But Moses would talk to God without any angelic mediation, they'll say. So it's kind of like this interior locution. These are the terms that are used by Montgomery Watt, right? He says, interior locution, in other words, this is something that Moses is sort of, um, he's sort of uh, um, comprehending within himself, these words that are sort of in his heart interior locution uh, without angelic mediation, right? And so even in our tradition, Imam Suyuti mentions that, you know, oftentimes the Prophet ﷺ would receive exterior locutions. In other words, Jibreel ﷺ would come to him and, and as a, in the form of a man and recite Quran and the Prophet would respond. That's called exterior locution. And the Prophet said, this is very easy for me physically, but sometimes it would be interior and it would begin like he says, the buzzing of bees or like the, the ringing of a bell that would form words. But it was still through an angel, but sometimes it would be directly into his heart. As Imam Suyuti says, this happened at least three times when Surah or Duha was revealed, Al-Inshirah, which is the next Surah, and then Khawatim al-Baqarah, the end of the Surah al-Baqarah, mm-hmm. because the Prophet Sallallahu received that beyond the Sidrat al-Muntaha, where okay. Jibreel alayhi could not pass. Okay. And that contains, the last two verses of Baqarah contain our essential aqidah. Right. And it was put directly into his heart. Mm. Right. So Musa alayhi salam, Allah. Um, and then Ibrahim uh, Isa alayhi salam, Ruh Allah. So what does Ruh Allah mean? Ruh Allah, so scholars say, uh, Wallahu alam, but one, one opinion is, Imam al Razi mentions this, is that because of the nature of the teaching of Isa alayhi salam, is very ruhani, is very spiritual teaching. Mm. He mm. confirms the Torah. It's not all, you know, sort of ruhani. Uh, in, in the sense that there's nothing to ground it. Right. And that's the problem the Pauline Christians made. If you, if you reject the Sharia, then you're going to start saying things that are shirk. Um, Correct. But, but basically, he's teaching them this kind of 
basically to sawaf. I mean, he's teaching them to skiyat on nafs and everything's about death and mot and akhirah and love of God and making God your priority and things like that. So his teaching is very ruhani. So he's called the ruh Allah, right? Um, and then the Prophet is, is Habibullah, mm. he's the beloved of God. He's the final messenger. He's the shafa'a. Um, uh, he's the shafir who's given the shafa'a on the yawm al-qiyamah. Um, and so... He's given that honor of Maqam Mahmud, as the Quran says, the mm. praiseworthy station on the Day of Judgment. And Allah revealed the final revelation to him. You know, mm. uh, so. You know, I, I wasn't intending to ask you this, but I mean, since we are on the subject of a sort of nomenclature, if you will, um, yeah. you know, I, what's always fascinated me is when the Quran. Like if you look at Medinan verses versus Meccan verses, mm. um, and we uh, like even terminology sometimes changes. And I was wondering if you could comment on the usage of Nabiullah versus Rasulullah. I haven't noticed that. Um, that's an interesting point. I'd have to do some research on that. Uh, but Nabi is definitely so. So the point uh, you're saying in Medina, the word Rasul is more prominent. Mm -hmm. Rasul. Mm. Okay. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to. Right. Okay. The, the Rasul um, in Hebrew would be Shiluach. They don't. I don't think they have anything like etymologically related okay. to Rasul. But but Navi is definitely the same word as Nabi, which was a word they used. Yeah, but okay. yeah, like in in Surah Al-Araf, yeah. you know, Rasul. There's Rasul and Nabi al Ummi. Yeah, true, true, true. Yeah, so they would know Nabi al Ummi. In fact, right. the word Ummi. In, in Arabic means Gentile. It has different meanings. One of the, obviously means unlettered, but it also means motherly. Mother, right. Right. It can also mean like leader, like umam or imam. But the, the, the Jews in Medina referred to the Arabs as ummiyin, which is Gentiles. And, you know, these are non-Jews. Right. Laysa alayna fil ummiyin sabil. Right. So, so, the, so that, that, there it doesn't mean unlettered. It could mean unlettered. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it can encompass all of these meanings. I see. But Nabi al Ummi, Wallahu alam, in this verse in Surah Al Araf 157, I think is a reference to Isaiah 42, where it does talk about a, a messenger to the nations, mm. right? Uh, in other words, a Gentile prophet is going to come. And interestingly, Paul, I think, in Bart Ehrman, this is his sort of opinion and an opinion of a student, that Paul in his letters claims to be this, 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 um, this uh, messenger to the nations, although he's a Jew. Saul. Saul, exactly. But if you read Isaiah 42, you know, it says, uh, or uh, it says, uh, it's, a, it's a construct phrase. So there's two ways to read it. There's a way of reading it like, uh, a light to the Gentiles, right? In other words, he may not be a Gentile or a light from the Gentiles, wow. meaning that he is a Gentile. Uh, and so I think... Isaiah 42 is a, is a very beautiful, perfect description of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It mentions, uh, uh, you know, the Kedarites and uh, who are Arabs because the second or the, the second son of Ismail, uh, according to the Genesis and according to Ibn Hisham, was named Qaidar. The Jews refer to the Arabic language as Leishan Qaidar. I will send you Liberid Am as a covenant for the people, Leur Guyim as a light. To or from the Gentiles, it could be sort of understood uh, both ways, right? And so, Wallahu alam, uh, it's possible that this verse in the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf um, is referencing this chapter in the Bible in the Tanakh Isaiah 42, which itself is telling about the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The coming, like, of the, exactly. Right. So you read that entire section there. Min al ummiin like sort of yeah, the idea of exactly. coming from the yeah. ummi, you know, the, yeah. uh, whether the unlettered or the Arab people. Yeah, and I mean Jews can't deny there are Gentile prophets. Again, uh, Abraham is a non-Jewish prophet. <laughs> you have um, um, a Lot, who's who's considered. Uh, according to some, to be a, a Gentile prophet, um, so they have they have these traditions. Do they recognize Adam as a prophet? I mean, uh, Adam, uh, not generally, no. Okay. So, so there's difference of opinion about these things, but yeah. uh, Rashi, who I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, he's sort of the standard here, I think, and so he mentions 55 prophets mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. Seven of the, seven of them are women, but the first prophet is Abraham. First prophet is not even Noah. Noah is called. Uh, an ish sedek, which means like a righteous man. Uh, but the first time the word nabi is used is for Abraham in Genesis chapter 20, I believe. Hmm. Uh, so that's where they that's where they start. And then it goes to 
uh, Isaac. And Jacob. I, I took us into a little bit of a digression, so I apologize. But thank you for <laughs> no, uh, humoring me nonetheless. Uh, yeah. But I wanted to sort of transition the conversation now specifically to the covenant of, of, of Abraham, because I think that uh, I think yeah. we can use to sort of then talk about what's going on now. But specifically in Genesis, you know, where God talks about the covenant, specifically yeah. with Abraham, about blessing him and blessing his nation and the people. There, whether the covenant was tied not only to Abraham and his descendants, so i.e. the idea of a people uh, or a nation, but also uh, to the, the land of Israel, and the I land of Canaan. We're trying to kind of decipher mm. current understanding Oh, yeah, we have to. Versus the current understanding yeah. of like modern day Zionists, I guess, versus our understanding yeah. as Muslims. Part of the problem is the text itself, right? So, I mean, the oldest, uh, the oldest complete manuscript of the Torah ever found uh, is the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is dated to the first century of the Common Era. So that's, you know, it's 1500 years removed from Musa alayhi salam. So that would be the equivalent of just now finding a Quran. <laughs> right. You know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. When you said 1500s, I couldn't help but think that. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. What would we do? And when, when was that found? Uh, it was 1947. Yeah. So by, it was found. By a Muslim. <laughs> two, so it was basically <laughs> like 3,500 years. No, but, so and the person finding it is a Muslim, right? I mean, so you know what I mean? Like to add further. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Dead yeah, Sea so, Scrolls. So, I mean, we have this idea of Senad in our tradition. Mm -hmm. It's very important. And Abu Bakr ibn Arabi, he said, this, the secret of our ummah is the Senad, right. right? And the Jews have an idea of Masora. They call it Masora. But there's definitely problems with their idea of, of Masora or, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of uh, train of, chain of transmission, transmissional knowledge. So that's the first problem. There, it's, we don't have anything. We, ha we don't have any Torah manuscript even remotely close to the time of Musa alayhi salam. So we have, we really don't know what was revealed to him right. in this regard. Now, if you look at the text as of Genesis as it is, yeah, Genesis chapter 15, God promises Abraham uh, and his uh, descendants all of the land between the two rivers, okay? So the two rivers, and, and some say those are the rivers on the Israeli flag. Some say this is a conspiracy theory. Uh, but anyway, there's, the two, there's blue, two blue lines, blue right? Lines. Yeah. Yeah, this you know, constitutes what's known as um, uh, Eretz Yisrael HaShlema, or Greater Israel, is between these two, two rivers. What are these rivers? The Nile in Egypt and Euphrates in Iraq, right. right? So that's considered to be Greater Israel, right? There's half of Egypt, all of the Levant, half of Iraq, <laughs> yeah. you know? Uh, so, so you have that passage there. Um, and then again, the problem is, you read a little bit further and it says, oh, my covenant I'm, I made with Isaac, not Ishmael. And is that from the same author? Uh, you know, because there's there's multiple authors that are writing the Torah. This is something that is mainstream, um, you know, crit biblical criticism. It's called the documentary hypothesis. Uh, the alternative is called the supplementary hypothesis. But both of them, uh, both of them basically um, uh, say that uh, multiple authors are writing the Torah. It's not one author. Yeah. And so uh, the author, the, the Torah, for some unspecified amount of time, remained an open text that people were adding to. Who, who was adding these things? And, and real quick sidebar, when you go to the what we believe as like hmm. Injil or, or uh, the original revelations of all the different pro prophets, hmm. were those as revealed like the Quran in the sense that they were... Um, they had like a, a, a recitation. Uh, what, what, how are they revealed in a sense? Like, because we talked about the scrolls ha being actually on written, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, Ibrahim alayhi salam received scrolls according to the Quran. Musa alayhi salam, like know. physical, physical, some sort of yeah. physical. Okay. Yeah, it's Correct. Correct. The afterlife is better than this life. This is what's written on the scrolls of Abraham and Moses. Now, if you look at the Tanakh, if you look at the Torah, which is ascribed to Moses, there's nothing about an afterlife. So clearly, there, there are books missing. There's something that was given to Moses uh, that is not in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In fact, if you read these five books, uh, quite often they'll quote something from a book that is lost, right? So in the book of Numbers, 
it says that, this is what it says in the book of the wars of the Lord. And there's a quote from something <laughs> called, the Sefer Melchamat Odonai, right. the, the book of the wars of the Lord. Where is this book of the wars of the Lord? It's lost. Do they recognize like text of Abraham? Um, yeah, they would say that generally uh, Ibrahim Ali so received like, some so books. Okay. Yeah, of course, Joseph Smith claimed to have. <laughs> ah, so Joseph that's Smith, right. I don't know if you know that's the story right. of Joseph Smith. Yeah. Mormonism. Mormonism, right. yeah. So Joseph Smith was living in Missouri, I believe, and yeah. and uh, there was a uh, one of these kind of uh, sideshow acts that came through, and, yeah. and and they had some mummies, and they had a scroll, and, and, uh, and he said, oh, that's the scroll of Abraham, and uh, he translated it, and it turned out to be a funeral text from the first century. It has nothing to do with Abraham. Um, so that was, that was was a major problem for the Mormon church. But anyway, um, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yes. So Genesis 15, right? Yes. Um, and then it says, but of Ishmael, I have heard him, uh, 12 princes he will beget. I'll make of him a great nation, mm -hmm. which is very interesting, Genesis 17, right? Uh, and then there are rabbis like um, Rabbi... Um, Mm. Bahia ben Asher, who actually says that that verse in Genesis 17 is a prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, <laughs> and he has this kind of interesting way of looking at it. He says, "I shall make of him a great nation, legoi gadol," and he says the numerical value of that is 92, uh, and the name of the Prophet sallam, mem chet mem dalit, is also 92. That's just sort of, and uh, kind of you know we would call like sort of salt, you know. Yeah. But then he says, um, he says, this actually came true that the, the rise of Islam and the Muslims overtook us because of our sins in a sense that we've been replaced. Now, he doesn't believe in total replacement, uh, but he does, believe, he does see a prophecy in that verse in Genesis chapter 17. Um, so, yes, I will give this land to your seed. Now, what about Genesis 12, right? I mean, I think that's what I took at, like, uh, yeah. again, my reading was that that was the sort of the original covenant, if you will. Yeah, Is well, that bless true? them that bless yeah, you. And correct. First them, like, yeah, that's, we bless Abraham in every single one of our prayers. That's what I found fascinating. That, Allah salli ala Sayyidina. Exactly. <laughs> and then if you look at... Kamas alayta. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's, it, it finds its fruition in Islam. It's, it's very clear, you know. Right, and then your your progeny will be as numerous as the stars, and there are there are a lot of Muslims, a lot more than Jews. Right, you know, mm. and they'll say, "What about the Christians?" I mean, Paul actually has a, an interesting way of looking at Genesis twelve, and this is New Testament. You know, Paul is supposed to be an authoritative writer, at least for the Christians. Mm -hmm. Paul says there that that Abraham's seed is Jesus and those who believe in Jesus. So Paul believes in this idea of supersessionism. So this idea that the Christian nation really just replaces Israel. Right, as the new covenant people, the new chosen people. This is traditional Christianity. It doesn't mean, again, a total replacement because Jews can still believe in Jesus and they have to believe in Jesus, at least according to traditional Christianity, to be, you know, to continue to be chosen by God. Um, but, uh, uh, but traditional Judaism, right, um, teaches very clearly, almost all Jews believed that, yes, the, God gave us the land, but it was on condition. Right. It's not unconditional, it's on condition. This is mentioned many, many times, as I stated in, in the Hebrew Bible, there's a wa'i, there's a threat to the Jews. If you do evil, God will expel you from this land. And traditionally, the Jews believe for almost 2,000 years that there's a divinely appointed exile, right? That they're, in other words, they're to remain in exile and not go back to the Holy Land until the Messiah comes. They have to wait patiently, right? Um, and so the problem with Zionism is that Zionism, uh, so when, when World War II happened, the Holocaust happened, right? Um, many of the Jews in Europe, Ashkenazim Jews, European rabbis, uh, they would say, well, you know, um, maybe we should go back, um, and, uh, be, you know, sort of get things rolling for the Messiah. Right, we need to begin the redemption. So this is a blasphemy, right? Now it's not to say that this comes out of nowhere. There were medieval rabbis like Nachmanides, not Maimonides, but Nachmanides, who was very extreme in his views, who would say that in every generation we have to go and conquer the land and kill the, you know, whoever is there from the river to the sea and so on and so forth. And this is a binding mitzvah in every generation. Uh, but most Jewish authorities during this time. 
uh, would say that this idea of going into the land and cleansing the indigenous people, that was a one and done. That was for Joshua and it's over and it's not going to happen again. Or like the opinion of Maimonides, it could happen again, but we have to wait for the Messiah. We can't do anything. We cannot return en masse mm -hmm. back to the Holy Land. That's blasphemy and that's rebellion against God, right? Um, and so, and so what, 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 uh, what Zionist rabbis were saying now in the 20th century is we can actually start going back and even conquer the land and then sort of force the Messiah to come out at mm -hmm. some point. So they call this the Hat Ga'ula. Uh, so in other words, the, the beginning of the messianic redemption. We can get the ball rolling and then Messiah will come and finish the job. So at the time, this was, you know, this was something that most Jewish authorities would um, repudiate and so, say, this is blasphemy. So these Zionist rabbis, I mean, because I mean, we, we, we know that Zionism initially emerges as a purely secular movement, right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the Jews in Europe who, yeah. who promulgate this early on are all secularist. Yeah. So how do they get the rabbis on board? Yes, yeah, very good question. So basically, and this, this, is, this is the great blasphemy according to the traditional rabbis, who are called the Heredim or Heredi rabbis, uh, the anti-Zionist rabbis, um, that uh, some uh, Orthodox Ashkenazi rabbis, um, because the goal is the same. For the Orthodox community, it's eventually to go back to the Holy Land, and for the secular Zionists, it's to conquer the Holy Land. So some of these uh, Orthodox rabbis, they say, well, look, this, this is an opportunity that we can take advantage of and begin this kind of process uh, of bringing the Messiah, although that is considered to be blasphemy according to the vast majority. Uh, so they saw it as an opportunity, right? Uh, and thus they broke what's known as a first oath. So the Talmud talks about these three oaths. Uh, this is in Ketubot 111a in the Talmud, uh, the three oaths. And the first oath is that uh, the Israelites are not to go back to the Holy Land en masse. Um, at any point, they have to wait for the Messiah. Uh, so the Zionist um, rabbis at this point, at, at this point in time, they would find these sort of loopholes to get out of this these three O's. Like some of them today would say, oh, these are just, you know, there's some opinion in the Talmud and there's many opinions in the Talmud. And, uh, but by far the dominant opinion is you have to wait for the Messiah. Uh, so some of these Ashkenazi rabbis, they unfortunately broke with their longstanding tradition and um, sort of went along with the Zionist agenda uh, and gave it a religious sort of flavor. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, these verses in Deuteronomy of um, you know, Joshua coming into the Holy Land, Deuteronomy chapter 20, and committing cherem. Cherem means like genocide of the indigenous peoples of the Holy Land from the river to the sea, um, and then killing the Amalekites wherever you find them. This is also found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. So traditionally, the vast majority of rabbis, uh, you know, they would say that these verses are highly contingent, they're very limited in their application, but the could Zionist you, rabbis. Could oh. you comment on the Malachites? Because I know that language, that rhetoric has been used yeah. more recently it as has, well yeah. by yeah. Netanyahu. By Netanyahu, yeah, and mm -hmm. others as well in mm -hmm. his party. And, yeah. Uh, High-ranking Israeli official. So basically in the Torah, we're told that the first group to attack the Israelites during the Exodus was a group called Amalek or the Amalekites. Um, and so uh, Amalek is sort of this perennial enemy of the Jews. You know, it says, uh, so basically, in, in, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, that Samuel, who was a king of Israel, was ordered to kill all of the Amalekites. But for some reason, he didn't kill their king, Agag, uh, who somehow fled. And, uh, and, and so, and then it says um, in Exodus that you're going to be fighting the Amalekites uh, in every generation. Okay, so who are the Amalekites? Um, there's difference of opinion. Uh, the dominant opinion amongst rabbis is that we don't know who they are. I mean, we have to sort of know who they are genealogically. We don't know who they are right now. Um, uh, and so um, it's not clear. So they take sort of this more tr uh, spiritual approach that you have to slay the Amalekite within, as it were. You know, these sort of dark impulses within your mm. own heart. And uh, mm. others say, no, the Amalekites are, we can identify them. Uh, you know, the Germans, uh, they were the Amalekites uh, uh, of, of their time. And some would say today it's uh, Iran. The Iranians are the Amalekites. 
Uh, some would say it's the Palestinians who are the Amalekites. So in other words, they have to identify someone as being Amalek, mm. right? Uh, someone who in their mind is, you know, basically um, the arch nemesis of, of Israel. Um, so, it, but anyway, yeah. so these 20th Thank century you. Ashkenazi rabbis, they, uh, in order to sort of um, uh, sink their own, uh, to basically to link or sink Zionist principles with their own Judaism, they would find these minority opinions uh, amongst uh, traditional authorities like Nachmanides, as I mentioned, who did believe that the commandment to, com to commit cherem or genocide against the indigenous peoples of the Holy Land is something that is uh, binding upon every Jew in every generation. That's a minority opinion, it's an extreme opinion. Uh, but because Zionism is a form of settler colonialism and part and parcel to settler colonialism is ethnic cleansing. I mean, read Rashid Khalidi's book, the, you know, the Hundred Years War in Palestine, and he makes it very, very clear. Uh, it's part of the DNA of Zionism. Right. Uh, is this, uh, you know, cleansing of the indigenous, either through genocide or through displacement or of some means. And this is something that's admitted by, uh, um, you know, scholars of, uh, of history that are Israeli. Um, uh, and, so, and so they couldn't resist the temptation of going back to the Holy Land, right, rather than being patient and waiting for the Messiah. Now, there are anti-Zionist rabbis that uh, we'll point to places like uh, Numbers chapter 14. We have the story in Numbers chapter 14 of some of the people of Moses. They said to Moses, we're tired of waiting in the wilderness. We're going to go back to the, we're going to go to the Holy, not back. We're going to go to the Holy Land now and conquer it. And then Moses says, why are you going against the word of the Lord? This will never succeed. The Lord is not with you, right? So they take this as a lesson that mm. we have to wait we have to wait for the command of God, and that command will come in the form of the Messiah. We have to wait for the Messiah, and he has not come yet. And, right? and, and the Messiah for Jews is who? The Messiah for Jews is a person who's going to come in the future, who's yeah. going to be from the house of David, uh, who's going to build the third temple, he's going to fight wars, he's going to bring the original Torah from the Ark of the Covenant. There's certain things he has to do, so he hasn't come yet. But there's no connection to Jesus. Oh, no. There's no in connection. The, in no. the Jewish tradition. Other than, the, other than rejecting that Jesus yeah, yeah. was the Messiah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I was going to be yeah, flippant yeah. and answer, well, well, for the Jews, the, the Messiah is, the, is a messianic figure. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, thank you for that. And so, uh, yeah, but, but to build on that then, so yeah. you're saying then that as traditionally understood then, that yeah. that, was the gate, that was the way to reclaim the Holy Land as it right. were, was through the, under the orders and guidance of the Messiah. Yeah. I mean, and because look, that has not come to pass. Yeah. I mean, is, as you said, the founders of, of yeah. Zionism were atheists. Herzl was an Herzl atheist. Herzl was an atheist. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one of the famous anti-Zionist rabbis uh, named Rabbi Israel Mayor Kagan, he said mm -hmm. the Zionists mm -hmm. are the dead limbs of the, uh, uh, he said the Zionists are the, are the dead limbs of our nation that caused the entire body to rot. In other words, these Zionists are giving Judaism a bad name, right? Uh, Rabbi uh, Yoel Teitelbaum, the founder of the Satmar Hasidic dynasty, his student is Rabbi um, uh, Shapiro, Yaakov Shapiro, anti-Zionist rabbi. He said the, the Holocaust was God's punishment for European Jews adopting Zionist principles because we're not going to go back to Israel and have this great kingdom under the Messiah through these atheist Gentiles. It has to come from a righteous king who is Jewish. Yeah. What are we doing? This is clearly a punishment, right? That was his opinion, you know? Uh, and so... No, I appreciate that answer. Yeah. And in fact, I asked this question to Professor Khalidi when we had Professor Khalidi on, as oh, well did, as... Also. Yeah, we did about three episodes ago, uh, though we were really gifted. And prior to that, I mean, another person probably just up the hill from you would be um, uh, Osama McDesi, a uh, mm -hmm. wonderful person, historian yeah. to engage as well, uh, who was sort of kicked off our sort of a series of episodes we did on, on, on Palestine. But I wanted to ask you also, because I think this is where we can probably end up concluding is, and, and I asked this question about, well, okay, fine. They convinced other, well, or not others, but they convinced people within the rabbinical community to also sort of go along with this project. Mm. Question I asked was, well, how'd they convince the rest of Europe? How'd they convince these European powers that be? And one of the things that did come up was this notion of Christian Zionism. 
right? Yeah. Appealing to a theology that was found in certain corners, not mainstream by any means, uh, among Christians. So I guess I wanted to sort of talk to you about that. I mean, if, yeah. if we can sort of segue what we've already covered and, and how that yeah. relates specifically to Christians. Right. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize this. That's right. Uh, but and how Jews themselves would respond to that, right? Yeah. Because like you said, there'd be rabbis who would say that, I mean, modern Zionism is sort of a cancer, right? It's sort of eating at the very core of, of Jewry. And so how do they reconcile that with, right, you know what I mean, like Christian Zionists? And, and, just, mm. and before you Ooh. answer that, like, what, one thing I'm finding interesting about this, it sounds, it all, if, if you're coming at this, not, not, not kind of knowing what's going on, going on in the political world in Israel, and you, you're thinking this is a very theoretical conversation, right? But in mm. reality, and Pervez, you know, you know about this. In reality, this is like more and more Relic. politicians, mm. etc., are right. like making making this not so niche anymore. I mean, this is not so much yeah. of a niche niche belief anymore. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Something happened in the 20th century where Christians were suddenly convinced. That, um, that basically God's covenant with Abraham uh, extends to modern day Jews and modern day Israel. Okay. And so probably what happened here was there was a Anglican preacher named John Nelson Darby, okay, who started something called the Plymouth Brethren in England. It was a very small group, a spinoff of the Anglican church. Um, but then his, so basically what Darby did it's very interesting. He looked at the New Testament and he said, you know, there's a difference between what Jesus is teaching, what Paul is teaching. And I completely agree with that, by the way. Right. Right. <laughs> it's two different gospels. <laughs> right. But 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 I he, Darby didn't have the luxury of saying, well, Paul is wrong and Jesus is right, because he's a Christian. So he has to sort of reconcile this somehow. So how does he reconcile it? You know, a, a scribe comes to Jesus in Matthew and he says, good master, what must I do to gain eternal life? I mean, ask a Christian right now on the street, how do I gain eternal life? He's, he's going to say, Except Jesus, Jesus died for yeah. your sins, for your sins. God, mm -hmm. you know. but Jesus says, follow the commandments and you shall enter the life. Follow the mitzvot of God. Follow the Torah and you shall... And then, so Darby said, wow, that's, that's interesting. And then you read Paul and, you know, it, you know, if you confess Jesus on your tongue and believe that God raised him from the dead in Romans chapter 10, then you shall have eternal life. So he said, this is two gospels. Right. So he started this idea of different dispensations. Right? So he says there's seven dispensations, in other, ways, in other words, seven ways in which God sort of interacts with humanity, a form of salvation. I see. So you have the fifth dispensation, which is the law of Moses, and then the sixth dispensation, uh, which is basically um, the Christian covenant. And since Jesus taught both of these, both of these are open to, to uh, today. Mm. In other words, in other words, there's dual covenant theology. In other words, Jews have a valid covenant to this day. In other words, Jews don't need to believe in Jesus. They're totally fine. Their covenant is valid, right? So when God says in Genesis chapter 12, and this is in the Schofield Study Bible, right? C.I. Schofield, this is the guy who changed a generation of evangelicals and made them Christian Zionists. Right. He's basically, I mean, he wasn't a scholar. He was basically a charlatan and a con man. He was probably wanted on charges and things like that. But anyway, he took the King James Version of the Bible because he couldn't translate, but he has his own really strange notes. Genesis 12, I will bless them that bless you and curse those that curse you, God says to Abraham. And then he says, aha, you see, we have to bless Israel because they're still chosen. They never cease to be chosen, okay? Uh, so it is our religious duty to love and support Israel unconditionally. So this is, and why is this, why is this a problem? Well, because Paul in Galatians, he actually comments on Genesis 12. And he says, what God was actually talking about there was Jesus and those who believe in him. In other words, belief in Jesus is the sine qua non. It right. is the absolute requis prerequisite of, of being yeah. God's chosen people. So it supersedes the Abrahamic covenant then, right? It supersedes right. it, yeah. I mean, that's what yeah. mainstream Christians that's, believe. That's mainstream Christianity. That's right, right there. Yeah, it's so this it, is but called supersessionism. Right. Yeah, this is called replacement theology. Super, but it's not total replacement because Jews can still believe in Jesus and become chosen once again. Mm -hmm. But this is traditional Christianity. The other thing is Jesus says he's the third temple. It's, it's very clear in the, in the Gospels 
right? Destroy this temple and I'll raise it up again. How can you destroy this temple? It took 46 years, but he was talking about the temple of his body. So for Christians to support the Temple Institute in Israel, where they plan on building a third temple, Jesus is the temple, and they plan on bringing back sin sacrifices. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, of course, I don't believe this, but this is the New right. Testament. Right. It's what Paul says in Hebrews. That's Paul says, right? As they say. Yeah. And, then, and, then, uh, <laughs> and then Israel is going to bring back these priests, right? But Jesus is the high priest, according to the book of Hebrews. Right. So this is total blasphemy mm -hmm. for a Christian to support Zionism, where there's going to be a new temple, a new priesthood, sin sacrifices brought back is total blasphemy, according to the New Testament. But they were hoodwinked by uh, John Nelson Darby, who, who made a mistake, well, not necessarily made a mistake, I mean, I, I agree with his assessment that Jesus and Paul are teaching two different things. <laughs> right. But the, the, the solution to that is, let me do some further research uh, and, and um, basically reject Paul, and then, oh, Islam actually is in almost total agreement with the actual teachings of the historical first Christians, as many historians have pointed out, and become Muslim. Um, well, in theory, Darby, or yeah, Darby is sort of rejecting Paul and Christ right at the end, right? It's because he's trying to reconcile both of them with this idea of a dual to. sort of covenant. He's doing his Where best. you can maintain a, du a dual yeah, covenant. Yeah, he definitely saw a contradiction extant. between Paul's teachings yeah. and Jesus' teachings. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, right? exactly. So you have an extant yeah. uh, sort of covenant that can coexist. Yeah, exactly. Right? Right. So for Darby, Jesus, uh, for, for Darby, God basically put the Jews on a timeout. He said, go, you know, go to your room. <laughs> right. Okay, you're, you're, you're still my chosen people, you're yeah. the apple of my eye, right. but you're on timeout. Then when Jesus comes back again, Right? Darby actually predicted this, national Israel will return, like a physical ethno state will return, mm -hmm. and he was right about that. And then when Jesus comes, uh, you know, the Christians are going to be raptured, right? And then God will once again turn his attention to his chosen people, okay. the Jews, and then they'll finally believe in Jesus. Now, yeah. how mainstream is the view, though, that in order to help facilitate or expedite the return of Christ, yeah. that the Jews must control the Holy Land? Is that integral to Christian Zionism, or is it is it integral to sort of mainstream Christianity prior to the advent of the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, I should say? Um, so in the book of First Thessalonians, mm -hmm. okay, it says that the Antichrist will sit in his temple. That's either First or Second Thessalonians. It's one of it's one of I think it's First Thessalonians. The Antichrist will sit in his temple. Okay, so Paul wrote this around maybe 55 of the Common Era. The Second Temple was still standing at the time. So that's what he probably meant. He probably didn't know that the Second Temple was going to be destroyed. But of course, Christians believe this is a prophecy of the future. So Christians are saying, okay, there must be a third temple then. But the Antichrist will sit in that temple. Okay, so it's a, it's a very strange sort of thing. It's like, okay, we want, we want to support yeah. Israel because we want them to build their temple. But then when their Messiah comes, he's actually going to be the Antichrist. But then Jesus will actually come, the real Messiah, and he'll destroy the Antichrist and we'll, you know, he'll convert all the Jews and we'll, it'll, everything will be okay. Right. Yeah. So that's, that, that's what they... <laughs> strange bed, bedfellows indeed. It's yeah. very strange. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, Kufi, which is the Christians United for Israel, the, the president was John Hagee, you know, this loudmouth oh, preacher from Texas. Yeah, help the, us. The, the, uh, the, the former executive director of Kufi was... David Brog, who was the cousin of Ehud Barak, wow, a Zionist Jew. Yeah, he's the he's former executive director of Christians United for Israel. You know, Baal to whom Olia as the Quran says. The Jews yeah. and the Christians are allies to one another. Yeah, you know, because they're using each other. You know, it's like uh, Israel can't survive without Christian dollars. Right. You know, it's like there was a rabbi who went to Israel. He was a Zionist, and then he looked around and he said, "This is totally wrong. We've become Pharaoh." And at least Pharaoh did not slay the women and girls. Wow. And he said, we've become Goliath, you know? Mm. So basically, we, we have this idea of typology as well in the Quran. It's not as pronounced as in like Christian exegesis. Define but it, typology. So typology, yeah. basically, you have uh, an event that happens in the past that sort of foreshadows something that happened in the future. So like uh, the, the modern day Pharaoh is Israel. But then who is Qarun and Haman? Who is the money in the military? Christian Zionists. There's a book by Dr. Stephen Sizer, and he's a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian. His book is called um, Roadmap to Armageddon. And he says Christian Zionism is this crazy roadmap 
to the end of the world. They want to see the end of the world. That's psychotic. Sharru fitna tin yuntadar, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, mm. the, the fitna of the Dajjal, of the Antichrist, is the worst of tribulations. You don't want anything to do with it. You know? But Israel needs evangelical dollars, right? And then the evangelicals, they, they want this temple to be built so Jesus will come back you know, and, and take over, you know, run the show, as it, as it were. So I would say, yes, yeah, Zionism, right. adopting Zionist principles, Right, whether in sort of a Jewish form of breaking the divinely mandated exile and going back to the Holy Land en masse, and then committing cherem, committing genocide of indigenous people, this is in rebellion to tr tr traditional understandings of Judaism. Okay, and this was the dominant opinion for almost two thousand years. Um, so that's from the Jewish side. From the Christian side, Zionism is also blasphemy because the Jews are no longer chosen. Now the Christians are the chosen people. Right? And you have to believe in Jesus to remain in good standing with God, as it were. You cannot reject Jesus. There is no such thing as a dual covenant. There's one covenant that Jesus made. This is according to the New Testament. Again, I don't believe this. I don't believe Jesus made a covenant in his right. blood. He died for my sins. No, but I mean, this is clearly the teaching of the New Testament. Exactly. You're simply holding exactly. Christians and Jews on the basis of their own scripture. Yeah. And if they believe that scripture, if Christians there believe their scripture, they, mm -hmm. have, they would have no reason to support Zionism in any way. Obviously, we would disagree with their theology. We can have a discussion about their theology, but at least they wouldn't be bankrolling genocide right. and war hawking for Israel. You know, so exactly. that's, that's a big problem. Stick to your guns. How many times you know, do we have in the Quran and the Hadith, فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ You know, st stand up straight as you've been commanded. You know, stand by your principles. Don't sell out. Zionism is a total sellout. They sold out, you know. Right. And, and a lot of people, they, you know, unfortunately, and, and they're victims. The they day is the Jews who believe in it and the Christians who believe in it, right? Exactly. I mean, that's what yeah. it is. And so, because exactly. it violates uh, their own principles, uh, whether you yeah. hold it, like whether you approach it from a Jewish. And that's what I really wanted to do with you, CD, was that sort of uncovering, you know, or looking at Zionism uh, and, and how it essentially is in violation of yeah. how traditional Judaism has understood this, yeah. you know, the land of Israel and how Christian, how Christians have traditionally viewed the notion of a covenant and where Christ sort of feels, fits in all of this because that seems to be so relevant now to modern sort of Christian Zionists who sort of then want to get on board here because they want to help facilitate, like I said, the yeah. second coming and the yeah. uh, Antichrist. Yeah, it's, it's a very strange mm -hmm. marriage. Right. You know, it's a dysfunctional marriage. Somehow it, it functions. <laughs> but yeah. uh, Rabbi Dovid Weiss, who's the head of uh, Natura Karta, who's uh -huh. one of the is one of the most um, popular, uh, or not necessarily popular, but um, well-known, I guess I could say, um, uh, anti-Zionist uh, Jewish groups. Uh, he shows this picture of May 14th, 1948 of, in Tel Aviv when Israel became a nation, and you have that long table and everyone's there, Ben-Gurion is there, Herzl is in the background, there's a big picture of him, and, and he says, look at these men, not a single one of them has his head covered, and it's a misfah for a man to cover his head. Wow. <laughs> wow. These are the founders right. of Israel. These right. are the founders of the, of the nation of the Messiah. <laughs> awesome. um, yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. So um, I guess for, for our listeners, you know, who, you know, these are dark times, and, and, and it's easy to get sort of distraught. And uh, so any sort of, sort of words of encouragement, if you will, or just sort of closing thoughts on... How, do, how does humanity prevail? And you know, how do we allow our humanity to prevail in these times? Yeah, so you know, we, you know, we have this idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he loves the people, he gives them tribulations. And you know, so people that are you know, murdered, people that are massacred, it's our belief that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, purified them of their sins in this world. And they're leaving this world without sin. You know, the Prophet he said, this ummah of mine is an ummah that has been shown mercy. You know, their punishment is not in the is not is in the dunya. It's not in the akhirah, mm -hmm. because ultimately we understand that the akhirah takes precedence over this world. That doesn't mean that we just you know become a doormat and things. No, we we try to you know establish justice justice and we speak truth to power and things like that and uh, and we try to um, you know create uh, you know just societies in the land and that's this is very very important actually um, and so. I would, I would just recommend or, you know, just as a word of advice, I'm a little bit probably, you know, the second half of my life and I have a white beard and whatever it's worth, here's some advice from me is, you know, stay positive, you know, take care of your prayers. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he won't change the condition of a people unless they first change what's within themselves. 
you know. So what we do, our choices, individually will affect uh, the society around us, uh, potentially for generations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, fear a fitna that does not only afflict those who are guilty, yeah. you know. And this, so there's this idea of transgenerational um, inheritance of sin, not literally, we're not, we're not literally inheriting people's sin, but the consequences of those sins, you know. Um, you know, for example, if, you know, I, if I, you know, commit a crime, a'udhu billah, and I go to prison, my wife and children will suffer due to the consequences of my sin. Now, they're free in, as far as, you know, they're innocent as far as, you know. The crime. The crime you of, you know, exactly, uh, in, the, in the next world. But in this world, people suffer due to our choices. Right. And so everything starts in the human heart, you know. You know so, so our heart should take precedence over what we see outside of us. If, and because we know that Allah is in charge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to obey him and his messenger. And if, you know, we, we can write to our congressman until we're blue in the face, we can march in protests. And we should do those things. Those are good things. But if we're not making changes within ourselves, yeah. you, know, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to raise up our condition. He's not going to change the condition of the believers through kuffar. It's going to be through believers. It's going to be through tawbah. You know, and this was the point that these anti-Zionist rabbis made. They said, you think God is going to manifest his kingdom with the Messiah through these atheist Gentiles that have started this so-called state of Israel? Of course not. There's no tofiq in that. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to work on ourselves. This is very important. Yeah, okay, and so establishing the prayer. If we're not praying, this is a major problem. Bain al-kufri wal-iman tarku salah. You know, the difference between faith and iman is the salah. As one of my teachers said, you know, like the shahada is like the canopy right? It's the canopy, but the, the prayer is the imad. It's the pillar that holds up the canopy. And if we're not praying, we have, we have major issues. One of my teachers said that non-praying Muslims, these are low-hanging fruit for the Antichrist. Yeah. They'll pick them off like this, right? Because it's the pillar of the religion, you know? So if you have a choice between going to a protest or doing your prayer, prayer every time. Try to do both, but we have to prioritize. Obedience to Allah and His Messenger must take priority. You know, because Allah is in charge. Allah can change our condition in a, in a heartbeat, right? So, or in the words of my... the words of our Father, you know, in nasarati wa nusuki wa mahiyya wa maati lillahi rabbil alamin. All of it, right? The no. the, the prayer, the fasting, yeah. the service, the sacrifice, yeah. the protest, the exactly. whatever charity you do, whatever you yeah. you know, writing to your congressman. Yeah. You know, your life and your death are for Allah. Everything right? and yeah, never everything. never underestimate anything. You yeah. know, if you if you're thinking I'm I'm not gonna mm -hmm. well what I'll just go get a McDonald's shake or something and. What, what, what is it, $2? What's that? No, Allah will take something small and change your entire destiny. We should never, ever uh, underestimate any act of obedience because mm. we never know where Allah's rida is. Wow. Right? Yeah. So, right. you know, there's a, there's a statement from Zain al-Abidin, rahimullah, who said that Allah has concealed three things and three things. He said he's concealed his, his rida and acts of obedience to him. So never underestimate any act of obedience to the point where a prostitute from Bani Israel gave water to a dog from her shoe. And that started a chain of events mm -hmm. where Allah gave her tawfiq and she made toba and she's a woman of Jannah, yeah. you know? Uh, so, and rida for those listening, I mean, like yeah. ple God's pleasure, right? exactly. exponential pleasure. Exactly, so even if it's a little thing like that, mm -hmm. you know, Allah, there's not little to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's in charge of everything. He can do, he can change our condition in any moment, in a microsecond, right? But this is part of the test of being in the dunya. We have to show sincerity. So to finish the, uh, the, the I think you said, uh, Imam Zain al-Abidin said that the three things yes. are hidden in three. Inna Allah khaba'a thalathan fi thalath. Uh -huh. Khaba'a ridahu fi ta'atihi. So Allah concealed th three things in three things. He concealed his uh, his pleasure in acts of obedience. Wa khaba'a suhutahu fi ma'asiyatihi. And he concealed his wrath and acts of disobedience. Mm -hmm. So you never know what act of disobedience. The, don't think, oh, I'm, I don't, I'm not murdering people. I'm not raping anyone. It, it, no, you don't know what it is. A, a lie to someone can, can make a chain reaction where that person runs with your lie and then there's, and there's another lie and then there's a crime. Who knows? We have to be careful. And then, mm -hmm. And then he has concealed his saints among the creation. Mm -hmm. So his point is, and he said creation. He didn't say bain al-Muslimin or some fil muslimin So in, a, in other words, always treat someone as if they're a saint of God, even if they're a non-Muslim, because you don't know how their end is going to be. Sayyidina Umar wanted to kill the Prophet. What's his end? He's in Jannah. 
Mm. He's literally in Jannah, a piece of Jannah on this earth. And his, his intention was to kill the prophet, the worst intention in history of humanity, right? So there's advice from our teachers. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Atay. Thank you for that. Thank you for uh, the generosity of your time for uh, Thanks uh, being for available. Me. I know you have a very demanding schedule. Um, I guess before we let you go, where can people uh, engage you, uh, read more about your writings, anything like that that you'd want to... Uh, Alhamdulillah. So um, I would start with, uh, there, there's a, uh, um, a YouTube channel called Blogging Theology. Paul Williams yes. uh, runs it from UK, uh, yeah. London. He's a beautiful brother, mm -hmm. convert to Islam. Uh, I have quite a few lectures there if people are interested in comparative theology, comparative religion. You know, the Prophet says in the Bible, was Jesus yeah. crucified, things like that. There's about maybe, I don't know, 20 hours or so, 25 hours of material to keep you busy there. <laughs> That's like five episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing blogging exactly. theology, you know, what I love what I love about his channel is just, he, the, like, just the, the commitment to the art of long form interviews. I mean, I respect yeah. that as a, yeah. as someone who's been doing this for 15 years, you know. Right, so, right. Yeah. And of course, you know, anything from Zaytuna college you know you I'm, I, I'm a professor there i've been there for about a dozen years uh so we have quite a few lectures on our channel um from different scholars at our college yeah. uh, i highly recommend uh going there as well um and so if people have questions you know my my information just is atuna.edu people can go there and and uh click on faculty and you'll see my picture there i'm a uh, i think i'm a few years younger than i am now but <laughs> I think you'll recognize me. You'll recognize my name, Ali Atai, and and uh, send me a message. Inshallah, I'll do my tr try to do my best to, to get back to you in a timely fashion. If people have questions, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you as always, and uh, listeners, if you have questions, comments, feedback, uh, you can email us at diffusedcongruence at gmail dot com. Uh, please uh, find us on various social media channels, and uh, as always, continue listening, and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence.